So it's wonderful for all of us to be able to cross over and say we are in 2019. Isn't that amazing? Uh, there are many people who wish they could have, others who are glad they didn't, but we're glad that we have. And it's an amazing thing that God has done for us. And I want to wish you all a very, very pleasant 2019, a blessed one, a one in which you will experience God and feel the presence of God. Amen? And so I want you to be thinking about that as you enter this day and as you enter this hour and in the next one hour as we spend together in the presence of God, that we would let God begin to speak to our hearts. Some of you have probably spent some hours. I listened to a few of you already and know you've spent some hours saying, Lord, 2018 and now 2019. And you've spent some time thinking through the process and you've thought you've had some challenging moments but also some very exciting moments, moments you will never forget. Moments that God did things that you never thought he would ever be able to do. And he did it. And he came through. And you'll never forget those moments. And those are the moments that are going to carry you even through the rest of your life. But through 19, 2019, you're going to remember those moments and you're going to move forward. But on the other hand of that spectrum, you're going to feel like, wow, there were challenging moments in my life. There were dark moments I wish I would never have to remember them again. And you're going to think to yourself that I want to forget those moments in my life. And I think that's what we ought to do. When we think about what has happened in the past, the Apostle Paul, you know, in the book of Philippians, he makes this statement. I want to know the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I want to know him in all of his power. I want to know him in in all of the power of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I want to confirm and become like him and be even to suffer like Jesus. And that is, our, is all of our motives, that one day we will be like Jesus. The very purpose of our redemptiveness is that one day we will not only know him, but we will be like Jesus. And Paul is saying, I want you to understand, even though I have gone through all that I have, I have not attained that state of being. I have yet to come to that place in my life. But he makes this statement, those things that have gone behind me, I leave behind. Those things that are before me, I press towards the price and the mark of the high calling that I have in Jesus Christ. And so when you think about the fact that what God is calling us to do is that we need to put behind the things of the past. Let's forget them. They may get in our way. They may try to discourage us. They may try to challenge our faith. But he wants us to put them behind. Those things of the past, he says, I leave them in the past and I press forward to the mark of the high calling. All of us have a calling in Christ Jesus, amen? amen? Only half of you have a calling? Let me try that again. All of us have a calling in Christ Jesus, amen? amen. Okay, I got you, I'm, I now know everybody is awake, all right? Now let's stay awake for the next 45 minutes and we'll try to finish this, all right? And have communion and a time very precious as we enter this year with the Lord, okay? So prepare your minds, prepare your hearts, prepare your thoughts. Bring before the Lord the commitments, you know, that you would like to make and say, Lord, I come to this altar and I make this commitment to you, O oh God, so that as I look at 2019, I look at it in a very, very significant way. Now what I want to talk about this morning, and maybe early, is to try and understand I want us to try and understand one of the most significant things that needs to happen in all of our life. And I want to speak about doing God's purpose in the context of history today. Not in the context of the past, but in the context of today. I want us to understand what is it that God is doing in our world today. What is it that God is doing in our time, in our history, 
And how is it that we need to begin to put ourselves into perspective, but not just into the perspective of history, but God's redemptive history? Because we are the children of God, and we have a call upon our life, and God has a plan for our life, and God wants to accomplish his plan in our life. And if there's any purpose for us to be alive today, is because God is not through with us. And because he's not through with us, we need to keep asking ourselves, what is it that he is doing in history? Recently, we, I had an opportunity to listen to a very significant scholar by the name of Tom Wolfe. Tom Wolfe is actually one of the professors in the University of the University Institute of Delhi, and his sphere and study of um, research that he has done is in the subject of leadership. He's done in the subject of political science. He's done in the area of global studies of what is happening in the world that is around us. And he wrote uh, an article recently, and in the article he made a number of different observations. And I think it's important for us to recognize that as we try to put ourselves into the historical perspective of this world. And then ask ourselves the question, because he makes an observation in, in the context of the biblical perspective of what redemptive history has as we try to put ourselves into the context of both of these realities, okay? So the first observation, very interesting observation, something you all probably know and have not, uh, will not question its reality, but may be surprised by the fact that it happened so long ago. But he makes an observation that for over 5,000 years, history has largely moved from the east to the west. From the east to the west. He says all the way back from Abraham in Ur, when he moved from out of Mesopotamia and moved on and moved places that he did, and the world history moved to places and centers, it all moved towards the west. It moved from Babylon, it moved to Egypt, it moved you know, up into, I into the European countries. It went into England, and from England, it actually crossed over the Atlantic Ocean and went to New York. And it went from New York to actually, for over a period of 200 years, all the way to Los Angeles. Historians would have expected that it would stop there. But the historians discovered that it moved from Los Angeles in the same direction and came to Hong Kong and then into China. He's making a point. The world is moving westward. The world is moving westward. History is moving westward. And we need to realize that it's going to continue to move westward until maybe it's made a full circle. And in the process of time, he's helping us understand if this is the direction it's moving, where am I headed? He makes another very interesting observation. He says some people live in history, but some people live in the history when it has turning points in history. And the most interesting statement that he makes about that is that the 21st century marks the beginning of a huge turning point. There are many turning points that he talks about in that article. When the world had gone through turning, colonialism is a turning point. You know, when the Second World War is a turning point. You know, there are turning points that took place, and every time these turning points take place, the world moves in a particular direction. And then that direction leads us to where we are. The wall, the Berlin Wall falling down was a turning point. And the world got connected when internet actually being linked us all together. And we are in a global world today that is different from any other time in the history. But there are specific things that happen, and during those events that take place, there is a turning that takes place. He says, when the planes crashed in on 9-11, it was a turning point. 
And so we are always in the context of some turning point that is taking place, and it's important for us to realize that the church goes through that turning point too. And that when God is revealing redemptive history, he's so doing it so that we understand that there are turning points where God is working in the midst of us. Very, very important for us to put our arms around that. So when he looks at history, unlike others, the secularist look at, looks at it in terms of progress. Others look at it in terms of its failures. Some of it looks at it in terms of its decline. Others of it looks at it in terms of its rebirth. But he looks at it in terms of what he calls providence. And what he means by providence is the divine involvement of God in the course and the unfolding of history. And he says, if you want to know where history is headed for, then you need to understand God's perspective of the end in mind. And he looks at Matthew and he says, Matthew says, the kingdom of God will be preached to all the peoples of the earth, and then the end will come. As a historian, as a political science individual, as a scholar of leadership, when he looks at these perspectives, he says, I want you to understand that God is actually in the process of facilitating an end, but the end will take place only when all peoples of the earth have heard the message or the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he says, if you want to know where the world is headed for, look at where the gospel is not preached. Look at where the gospel is not preached. For you know what he's saying? When you look at history and you follow history and you follow the history, you almost follow the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel was preached all through Europe. The gospel was preached into, into the United States. The gospel was taken from there to the other parts of the world. And it got into China. And that's where it is today. And the gospel is being preached to the ends of the earth. And he's saying, you know, you want to follow it. And you want to ask yourself, where is God leading redemptive history? Because all of history is going to move in that direction. But he says you need to understand, through all of that, there are turning points. There are turning points. And he looks at the 21st century and he says, the 21st century is a very interesting century. Because in redemptive history, there is going to be a turning point that we need to put our arms around in order to be part of what God is going to do. And what God is going to do is very interesting. He's going to see that the world has been reached with the knowledge of the glory of God. Amen? There's not going to be a single person on the face of this earth that do not have the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's going to happen all the time Till that has been accomplished. Until that is accomplished, God will not come back. But when that is accomplished, the world is ready to receive our Heavenly Father. And the question is, you have to ask yourself, if this is God's intent in history, if this is what God wants to do through history, and the church is his redemptive instrument, and his kingdom community is the one that is going to build the kingdom of God, then we need to ask ourselves, how do I fit into God's redemptive plan in the unfolding of his history at turning points all through history? Very important for us to look at that. Because I believe that we are at that point, and what he's saying in this article is, there are two dynamics that every church, every follower of Jesus Christ need to understand. He says the first thing that you need to understand is that the world is moving from the ordained to the ordinary. Can you say that with me? From? One more time. I want everybody to say it. From the ordained to the ordinary. What he's saying is 
that the time is coming that when every man, every woman, every boy, every girl are going to be part of every part of God's redemptive activity in our world and the possibility of completing the Great Commission is going to be directly proportionate to our understanding of saying, Lord, if this is what you're doing in history, I want to be part of it and join God and say that everybody in the church of Jesus Christ engaged in the mission of God. Amen? Nobody should be exempt. Everybody should be saying, I am a child of God. I am an instrument of God. I am going to do the mission of God. No matter what it takes, I'm not going to turn it over to this professional. I'm turning it loose to myself so that I can become God's most powerful instrument to finish the Great Commission in our world. The second thing is that about the 21st century, it's that the 21st century is going to become the sister of the first century. The 21st century is going to become the sister of the first century. You know what they're saying by that? He's saying the 21st century is going to revert back and instead of us being in the context of professional Christianity, we're going to go back and Christ is going to become incarnate in every Christian home around the world again. Isn't that an amazing thing? It is a statement that we need to be understood because what he's saying in that statement is that the, the, 20, the, the first century Christianity, they offered their lives unconditionally to God. The first century Christians offered their lives unconditionally to God. And he's saying that if the church of Jesus Christ is going to become part of what God's redemptive plan is, and they're going to join God in that process, the turning point is taking place, and everybody in the church of Jesus needs to become unconditional about their lives as a commitment to God. And when we come to the realization of that, there will be no place and no room for selfishness. It'll all be about, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What is it that you want me to do? The second observation he says about the first century is, every home became generously opened for the mission of God. Every home, if the gospel became accessible to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, inside the context of the first century, it's because it did not centralize the worship of Jesus Christ. It decentralized it into the context. Instead of it being in the temple, it was in the homes of people. So mission is going to become one of the most significant things. And what Wolf is saying is, we're going to continue to move to the West. We're going to continue to be part of the agenda of God. We're going to see that the kingdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be preached. And every follower of Jesus Christ is going to become unconditionally surrendered to Jesus Christ. We're generously going to act. And as we act generously, we're going to turn our businesses into the most integrated businesses of integrity and that there will be people who are God's spirituality. These are four dynamics that he says that is true of the first century. And he says, if you are the sister of the first century, you need to look into this. But I want to tell you something, and I want us to look at the story of Mary. Because Mary's experience was a turning point in history. 400 years and there was a silence from God. God didn't speak. And then God breaks into history. And he begins to talk to people. And one of them is Mary. And he stops to Mary. And I'm going to let Malini to read for us the text. Because I want you to follow with me on through this text. Because the text is very, very interesting. I want you to look at it from a narrative point of view as we begin. And then we look at it from, an, uh, from a homiletical point of view. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38 and verse 45. 
Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Now, in the sixth, sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city, city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Verse 45, Blessed is she who believed, for there will be fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. I want you to look at that narrative. I want you to look at the story. I want you to understand the context because the context is that God had not spoken for many, many years and there was a great silence for hundreds of years and now God is beginning to speak. And he's speaking and he's speaking and when he speaks, there always appears to be a turning point in history. And this is a turning point that is taking place. But I want you to look at it because he's, whenever there is a turning point, God is going to ask us to do things that are beyond our imagination. He comes to Mary and he sends Gabriel and he says, Gabriel, I want you to go and I want you to talk to Mary. And he says, Mary, I have found favor with you and I bring greetings. And Mary's immediate reaction is, wait a minute, is this real? Is this really true? Can I really embrace this? She's struggling because what Gabriel is saying is, I you have been found with favor before God. And God is constantly looking for people. He's looking for individuals. He's seeking individuals and he's seeking out that people will be found in favor with God so that God can take those individuals and he can accomplish his purposes through those individuals that he wants to accomplish them. And he looks at Mary and he says, God has found favor with you. And I believe one of the turning points, one of the challenges we are going to face is God is going to break into our history. God is going to speak to us. God is going to talk to us. And he's going to come and he's going to say, you know, I have chosen you. And our reaction is, I'm confused. I'm troubled. This cannot be true. I don't want to be engaged in this process. Should it not be somebody else? Why me, Lord? And you'll go through that experience. And you know, the text actually says what Mary was doing as Gabriel came to her was, he was she was reasoning in her mind. She was trying to find the rationale, the logic to what God was trying to say to her. And the message he brings to her is even harder because he says, not only does he say, say not only does Gabriel say to Mary that you have found favor with God, but I want you to know, don't be afraid, because I want you to know that you are going to bear a child. Whoa, about this time, Mary is probably going crazy. How can this be? Is her reaction. She's asking, how can it ever Because you know what? I'm a virgin. I'm betrothed. I have not 
had any relationship with anybody. I've not known any man. There is no possibility for me to bear a child. And then he reveals to her, this is no ordinary child. What I'm calling you to do, he says, is part of being the kingdom of God. You're going to bear the child who is going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and his kingdom shall be forever. About this time, I think Mary is totally out of whack. She hardly can understand what is going on. But into the midst of that, she asked the question, how is this possible? How is this possible? And he says, I want you to understand that the power of the Holy Spirit and God will come upon you and the impossible will become possible. And I want you to understand this because in a turning point, God is going to come to you. He's going to give you a message. He's going to call you to an action and he's going to ask you to do things that are probably um, impossible. They're probably impossible. And you're going to look at it and say, there's no rationality to this. I remember the day when God said to me, Bobby, I want you to actually plant a million churches in this country. And I said, it's impossible. But it's true. And he's making it happen. And I want you to understand that when God calls us and he's saying to us, we're going to be like the first century and we're at this turning point where the ordained is not going to be the centrality of it. It is the ordinary that's going to take the responsibility to take the mission of God. Then you need to be anticipating he's going to talk to any single one of you. Any single one of you. And he may call in you to an act of an impossible task. But the question is, are you willing and open to say, God, I am ready to do whatever it takes to accomplish your mission, O oh God. So he goes through the process and he actually tells her, Mary, I want you to understand. You may think it's not possible, but I want you to know Elizabeth, she's caring. She's your relative. You can go check out on me. But I want you also to understand there is nothing too hard for the Lord. There is nothing impossible with God. You know what happens to Mary in this story? She shifts. Somewhere in her mind, she comes to the realization, this is really true. This is really happening. This is actually going to happen. And I have no choice. And what a privilege for me to be part of a redemptive part of what God is doing. And she moves in her mindset from a state of saying, this cannot be. It is impossible. It is confusing. I cannot embrace this. This is beyond my imagination to saying, Lord, I want to be your servant. And let it be as the word has been declared. And she becomes the servant of God. And I believe this is very, very important as we begin to understand this. Because I believe as truly as you're sitting here, what God is going to do in the 21st century, in the next two or three decades, I believe God is going to turn every man, every woman, every boy, every girl to become part of his redemptive purposes. And as we begin to say, yes, Lord, in this turning point, we are going to become like the first century, and we're going to turn our homes. We're going to turn our lives. We're going to turn our businesses. We're going to turn our working places into the things that you want to do to reconcile the world to yourself so that every people group in the world will have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand that if we come to the place in our life where we begin to understand that we're at this turning point and we say, Lord, take my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. You know what will happen? God will put his hand upon your life and he will use you. Am I willing to walk through and take that act of faith and say, Lord, in this turning point in history, in this redemptive history, Lord, I want to be part of what you're doing. And if you're going to take individuals wherever you want them, whoever they are, in order that they can become your redemptive plan, Lord, I am available. 
I'll trust you. And just like Mary, from that place of uncertainty, from that place of struggling with God, from that place of actually feeling insecure, you will move to a place of total surrender and say, Lord, here am I. Take me and use me. And I want you to understand, the day you do that, you will realize the God of impossibilities will make everything possible. Everything. There's nothing impossible for God. And just like Jesus, you'll come to the place in your life where you'll say, Lord, Father, if this is what you will, I'm willing to go to the cross. And Paul says, unconditionally, he emptied himself. He took upon the form of a man, and he became a slave to die on the cross for you and me. The Apostle Paul, when he confronted Jesus, he himself had to come to the place where a persecutor became a slave for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we will all turn to become servants of God. The question is, am I willing to come to that place in my life where I'm willing to say, Lord, 2019, history is a turning point. We are in the turning point where you want to use everybody and I want to be your instrument. And wherever you take me, I'm ready to go. Whatever you want to use me, I'm ready to use. And church, this morning, I want to ask you, so many of us can make our homes a place of contact so people can come to know Jesus Christ. The question is, am I willing to make the time Am I willing to make the sacrifice? Am I willing to open my home? Am I willing to be like the first century Christians, unconditionally unlocking my home and becoming so generous with my home that people who have never been discipled can be discipled to Jesus Christ? I believe what God wants us to do in this turning point in the history is to ask ourselves, how can I serve God in whatever capacity that I have, whether it's in your workplace, whether it's in your company, whether it's in your coffee break, whether it's at your lunch time, whether it's actually with the resources that God blesses you with, whatever it is that God does, that you will say, Lord, I will become your instrument. Unexpected things were happening. You know what? when we surrender our lives to God and say, I am going to be a servant, you use me, you know what happens? The impossible begins to happen. The question is, are you willing to let God work in your life? I remember the story of Captain Booth. Captain Booth is the guy that founded the organization called Salvation Army. And Captain Booth, when he formed that organization, had the faintest idea that God was going to make him a globe, have a global impact. He simply was an ordinary individual that wanted to serve community. And he began to work for the poor in England. And then one day, while he was in his, home, I mean, in his office, thinking about it, God began to work in his heart. And he began to look at the world, and he began to realize not only does England need what he's doing, but the world needs all that he's doing for the redemptiveness of those communities. And that day when he was there, he said, sitting in that chair, God helped him realize if he wants to make any difference in our world, we have to be willing to give our will, our mind, our resources, everything that we have into the hands of God. And as he told the story to a young man who was going to author a biography of him, this author said the day that he gave everything to God, God put his hands upon him, and he became God's primary instrument to carry out 
the mission of God. I often say the proportion of our surrender is directly equivalent to the effectiveness of how God is going to use us. This morning, as we come across into 2019, we gather around this table. May I invite you to say to the Lord, Lord, I want to be part of this turning point. I want to be an individual who has given himself totally and completely to be part of your mission. I want to believe in the impossible and trust you to accomplish it. And Lord, I'm going to become your servant. So take the self out of me. And I'm going to surrender it today at the altar as I partake of this, your body. I'm going to follow you in every way and let God take our lives. And church, keep this at the back of your mind. 2019, make it foundational for the beginning of the next decade so that God can take us and use us in 2020 in a way like we've never seen so that the next 10 years from there, the world can be touched in the most powerful way with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen?